Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a highly acclaimed writer and producer who's brought us some of the most iconic and beloved television shows of our generation, including Wings, Stark Raving Mad, Frasier, Stacked, Back to You, Desperate Housewives, Rules of Engagement, Modern Family, and many more. He wrote many episodes from the shows I've just mentioned, and he also wrote two of Barbara Streisand's TV concert specials, Streisand Live in Concert and Streisand Back to Brooklyn. And in 2010, he wrote the 82nd Annual Academy Awards show for which he received an Emmy Award nomination. The list of accolades and awards this man has received is truly jaw-dropping. For his work on Frasier, he won an Emmy Award for Best Comedy Series. And for his work during 10 seasons of Modern Family, he won five Emmy Awards, including one for Outstanding Script, three Writers Guild Awards, three Producers Guild Awards, an American Comedy Award, and a Golden Globe Award for Best Comedy Series. He's currently the co-creator and executive producer of a wonderful series called Uncoupled, starring Neil Patrick Harris, now going into its second season on Showtime. I'm delighted to welcome Jeffrey Richmond to our show. Jeff, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I want to start by asking you about Jeff Richmond, the comedy writer. You have a knack for tapping into the funny aspects of life that everybody can relate to. What drives your sense of humor? Boy, that's an interesting question. I think all comedy writers have a certain amount of, I don't want to say pain, but come with a certain amount of baggage. That's why you don't see a lot of gorgeous comedy writers. <laughs> I think in order to develop a funny bone, a sense of humor, there, there probably has to be adversity as you're kind of growing up. And a lot of us, I think, push back against that by develop, by being funny. And that kind of pushed the bullies away a little bit. So it's a coping mechanism. It's a defense mechanism, but it ultimately turns into a tool that can make you very successful. Well, it's it, you start with seeing things a certain way, and then you actually learn a, a craft. So it's two things. There are, I think, comedy writers who aren't that funny in real life, but are very funny on the page. And certainly there are a lot of people that are hilarious in life that can't write. So you have to be able to merge, I think, your natural instinct of seeing things in a kind of skew funny and, and understand the craft of whatever form you're writing in, which in my case was for the length of my career, broadcast situation, comedy, television. So when you were growing up, I know that Neil Simon was a comedy giant that you looked up to. Were there others? Yes, I, I, I'm sure there were, uh, you know, Mel Brooks and, and that sort of broader. Neil Simon, the, the, the dialogue, of Neil Simon was truly the, I remember being maybe 12 years old and seeing the movie of Barefoot in the Park. And I I, I just simply had never laughed that hard at a, a, a piece of entertainment. And, and it was very sophisticated and I just couldn't believe how funny it was. And I recently rewatched it. It's just as funny. My, husband, John Benjamin Hickey, last year directed on Broadway, Sarah Jessica Parker and Matthew Broderick in Plaza Suite, which I hadn't seen. I hadn't seen the play, I think maybe ever, but even the movie. And uh, again, I was just, I was just blown away by how structurally perfect his take on building a story a comic story was i was just yeah he's he's the big one yeah well he's a pretty great role model because he has intelligent humor and it's layered and it's complex and it's textured 
And I can see how the influence of that kind of comedy would rub off on you. But you initially started out as an actor. And if I'm not mistaken, you transitioned into becoming a writer almost accidentally. Isn't that right? It is. I was in an improvisation class in the sort of late 70s. And at that time, there were some some just beginning to be famous comedy people in the class. Uh, Robin Williams, John Ritter, Penny Marshall. They were they were just kind of starting out in their whatever. So I got to train alongside these people. And the instructor, Harvey Lembeck, who was himself an actor, got a deal to write a, a television special about the class. And it was for Showtime. And Showtime at that point, this is how long ago it was, was not a signatory of the Writers Guild. So he couldn't hire union writers. He needed non-union. So he asked me and a woman who became my writing partner if we would do it. That was my first time ever writing anything. And it kind of, even though I was still acting, it kind of put me on a course to, wow, you can do this. You, you know, you have to be hired to be an actor and you can write every day. So we started to do that. And, and just luckily, if I had set out to be a writer, I don't think I would have had the same kind of opportunities and luck kind of fall into my lap. And everything I wrote, I learned on the job. I never still have written a spec script. We just got hired. Ultimately, we split up and I went on my own and I, I, I lucked into some pretty big hits and I was on some dogs that lasted just a season, but I always, always worked, which is unfortunately what we are striking about now, because the thing that I did for literally 40 years, which was write network sitcoms, that job is gone. That job doesn't exist anymore for writers. So without getting all Norma Ray, middle-class writers can no longer make a living at the thing that I've been doing. I can afford to do eight episodes of television and maybe a 25 year old can afford to do that. But if you're 45 and you have kids and they're going to college and you have to live in Los Angeles, it's gone. Yeah, it's so just it's not gone. feasible. And uh, I think the public is behind you. And, and I, I know that the actors are behind you. And those well, the of us in media themselves. And those of us in the media are very supportive. If you're a coffee lover like me, it's always fun to discover a great new blend. I recently found a terrific new company, Breakfast at Dominique's, that's created a series of coffee blends to honor the legacies of the greatest Hollywood legends. And I'm thrilled to tell you that now, Breakfast at Dominique's has introduced the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend. It's my very own exclusive, delicious, bold, rich, balanced, medium roast coffee, and I just know you're going to love it. It's made from high quality organic beans produced using fair trade practices. If you'd like a great cup of coffee, give Breakfast at Dominique's a try and order the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend at hollywoodblends.com. They'll ship it right to your door anywhere in the world. Sipping our coffee is the perfect way to watch our show. Do you think that comedy writing, or maybe I should be more specific, comedic thinking, is comedic thinking something that can be taught or do you just have to be innately funny? Hmm. I think the craft of writing plays or films or television shows absolutely can be learned. I've known a few people who can technically craft a joke without necessarily being hilarious at a party, but I don't think you can write 
I don't think you can learn how to be funny at all. I, I, I think you either have the perspective of looking at something and seeing it in a comedic, you know, fashion, or you don't, or you're writing Law and Order. Can you describe the feeling of seeing an actor speaking your lines, bringing your work to life, and then seeing an audience laugh because of something you wrote? What does that feel like? Exquisite. It's, well, for one thing, it's, you're, you, you sort of can't believe that it's this communication, this three-way communication. Like, I thought of it, the actor took it and interpreted it their way, and that went out to the audience, and then it's coming back to me in the form of laughter. You know, when, like a show like Frasier, which was done in front of a live audience, when you hear that immediacy of, a, of an audience laughing at something that you wrote, and now Kelsey or David Pierce or whomever is saying it, that's one unbelievably satisfying experience. And another is watching it on television when it's like Modern Family, when it's not shot in front of an audience, you can see, like when you're watching a movie, you can see that it's your intent as interpreted by the actor has landed has communicated. I mean, nobody, I, I I sit like an idiot and laugh at stuff that I've written as I watch it. It's, it's embarrassing. It's, a, it, it's ridiculous, but I think it's so funny. I hope you're proud of yourself when you, when you see that. I'm proud of very few, very few things do I look at and go, that's a perfect joke that in, in, in the hands of that actor. Modern Family, for me, as a gay man, the fact that for the first time I was writing characters that I thought that I know would have a meaningful impact on gay kids and their families that were watching this splendid group of people that the gay couple, the gay parents, we're telling, I mean, if I was nine or 10 years old and just starting to realize that and to know that I was going to grow up and get married and have children and be part of a bigger extended family, I I, I just can't. And I had a pretty smooth ride. You know, I, I, I wasn't traumatized, but the fact that I was contributing to other people and 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 straight parents for their children to know, oh, I don't have to worry because so many parents just worried they'll never have grandchildren. They'll never, the, it'll be so hard for that child to find love in the world. That was incredibly meaningful. And then to make them funny, first of all, those, every actor on that show was an all-star, but Jesse and Eric particularly, to write for them was just heaven. It's heaven. Well, that's that is for sure. And I can tell you, as a gay viewer, Frasier was always a confusing show for me because I am I one of the few people that assumed that eventually Niles would be revealed to be gay. You must have heard that from other people. Yeah, people thought that they were boyfriends, Frasier and Niles. No, there was in no no way. He was an effete, you know. He was he was just he. The idea behind Fraser, who was a supporting character on Cheers, when you put that character, who was so snobby and intellectual and loved opera and wine and women, when you put him front and center in a show. There had to be somebody even more Frasier than Frasier so that Frasier would look normal, <laughs> be relatable. So that's how the character of Niles happened. And, you know, after a while, you forget. I mean, obviously, David Pierce is gay, but 
perfectly brilliant, gifted actor who I think in no way saw Niles as conflicted sexually. He was in love with Daphne. That's so interesting. Does your experience as an actor help you as a writer? My experience, I think, in that improv class helped me as a writer. It helped me understand, number one, how to think on my feet and be funny and come up with characters and particularly come up with lines. Plus, like I said, that class had so many all-stars that when you're thrown on stage with one of those people and the class was full of them, you've, you've got to swim with them or you're going to sink and in front of the class. So there was a, there was a great, that was a great training ground. And that was about two or three years I was at that class. You know, some comedy shows don't age well, so they don't have a lasting impact. For example, a lot of the skits from the variety shows in the 70s, they're just not funny now. But your shows, Jeff, are just as funny now as when they first aired. And when you look at how much society has evolved, that's actually quite an accomplishment, don't you think? Well, thank you. Some of the shows that I've written, I think, can stand the test of time but like i said a career is a lot of peaks and valleys and i had some pretty pretty deep valleys too that you know that even though i never knock wood i never worked with a monster in in, in terms of either a creator of a show or a star which many people have and which poisons the experience even of a hit. There were a lot of hits, especially in the 80s and 90s, that either the person that created it, who ran it, or the star that was the head of it made the experience toxic and terrible. I never had that, even, even on shows that were not hits, which there were many. The job was always fun. But those shows, when you're on a show that has been somehow flawed in its conception, you you, you can have a, the, the most all-star writing staff in the world. You can't write yourself out of that flaw. And so the show will fail because in its infancy, in its in its creation, there was something wrong with it. So the relationships weren't real or the casting wasn't good. Something, something was wrong with it. And so those shows, no, those shows went away. Even, I mean, back to you had Kelsey Grammer, Patricia Heaton, Ty Burrell, Josh Gad, Fred Willard. I mean, you, you, you couldn't ask for a, if you were looking for funny actors and it just didn't work. It just didn't work. And, but it was a great job with fabulous people. And it was the show that Steve Levitan and Chris Lloyd created just before they created Modern Family. So nobody's got the formula. You could go from that show, which got canceled after one season, your next show becomes Modern Family. Yeah, that was just magic. You know, when we had comedy writer Susan Silver on the show, I saw and that. Cast, and casting director Joel Thurm, they both talked about the challenges and pressures of coming up with scripts that would satisfy network executives, producers, sponsors, sometimes even the actors. What was the impact on you, Jeff? of not only being a writer, but in many cases, also being the producer of the show. Were you protected from a lot of the scrutiny? You know, nobody gives notes on a hit. And when a show is in trouble, you're noted to death. So I've been, I've had both experiences. I created a show years ago with Nathan Lane and Laurie Metcalf, where he was an openly gay, uh, congressman who a former tv star 
that became a congressman, lasted one season. And even though they were very enthusiastic about it, the network, they were nervous. This was 25 years ago almost. And I got a lot of notes. And conversely, the show that Darren Starr and I have recently done, Uncoupled, which is about a gay man whose partner blindsides him after 17 years and walks out of the relationship. We literally got no notes on anything. And and they were, it just wasn't even a, I mean, that's kind of how far we've come. But yeah, it's a drag to, to be on a show that's struggling and try to address notes that ultimately you learn when you're been doing it a long enough time, you take the note that is relevant and helpful and you never ever take a note because somebody, an executive gave it to you. You I, I, I'd rather take a note from, you know, the, the assistant from that, that helps then take it, then Im impose that note into a script, cancel the show, cancel it. But I'm not going to I'm not going to write that thing that I know is not helpful. I love that because you're so principled and you have a vision of how you want your show to be. And you're not going to be bullied because it is a form of bullying, I think. Now, you mentioned, of course, Modern Family was such a groundbreaking series in many respects, especially the representation of the gay couple, Cameron and Mitchell. And I think it's well known that Modern Family contributed enormously to the American public's ultimate acceptance of same-sex marriage because of the likability and popularity of Cam and Mitch. When you look at the feedback that you got from fans of your other shows, like Frasier, for example, which I'm sure was very positive, and you compare it to the feedback that you got about Modern Family from the public, I will bet there's no comparison in terms of how personal and emotional the impact was of Modern Family. Am I right? Well, I mean, it's kind of apples and oranges. When I was on Frasier, that was perceived as a writer's show you yeah. Frazier had a mystique about the writing first of all it was scary because the bar was so high to come into that show and frankly the turnover on that writing staff was significant because if you didn't pull your weight if you didn't come through with scripts with stories with pitches you were gone, you were gone. So the fear factor, while it was still wonderful and won awards and people would, people just loved it. Those characters were so different because for one, it was, you know, a very theatrical, multi-cam. It was relatable because of the the, the relationships between the dad and the sons, but it wasn't realistic like Modern Family. We did one episode of Frasier where they went to Seattle and we filmed, you know, Frasier never went outside. It was always on sets. Well, this, for the hundredth episode of the show, we went to actual Seattle and they filmed on the street. Those characters looked insane next to actual people that were walking. They just looked like Macy's floats. They were so big and theatrical. You couldn't put them next to like a pedestrian. <laughs> they looked crazy. Modern Family filmed outside all the time because those characters were real. It wasn't a laugh track. It was, you know, if... They they were funny in a in a in a much different way. But in terms of the fan reaction, wasn't the reaction to Modern Family much more emotional and personal well, by for fans? Me, for me, for sure, as a gay man. Yes, Modern Family, it was just a phenomenon. It was also the last, the last train out. 
there aren't network sitcoms that have that kind of resonance anymore. There aren't network that, again, that animal is just gone. And Modern Family really was the last. Juggernaut. Last yeah. Well, you actually wrote 32 episodes of Modern Family, including classic episodes like the New Year's Eve episode from season four, the Valentine's Day episode from season six, the graduates from season eight. We need to talk about Lily from season 10. And of course, part one of the finale. How much of the episodes you wrote were based on situations in your own life? That was the thing about that show that was different than pretty much. I mean, you're always pulling a little bit from your life, but the writing staff of that show had to super dig into our lives to come up with stories. Almost every, I mean, not only scripts that I wrote, but stories that I contributed to came from my relationship. I mean, from experiences that I had, the, the script in season two, that Steve and I shared the Emmy for caught in the act where the kids walk in on Phil and Claire having sex. The other story in that is that Cam and Mitch spill something on a scary lady's rug and they are trying to figure out how to, if they can move the rug so that the stain is under a piece of furniture that came from literally I spilled red wine on my friend's very expensive rug and with the help of some other people turned the rug around so that it was under a heavy piece of furniture and she never found out when I pitched that story first of all I was going should I do I reveal this? We were in such trouble. We needed a Mitch and Cam story to go alongside that, that caught me act story. And I thought, Oh, I'm going to, I'm going to reveal this about myself, but we needed the story. And that's how all of us felt. And I pitched it. Everybody loved it, but they thought it was so unlikable that they got away with it, that we changed that ending so that they, at the last minute, they told her about it, which I never did until she saw that episode on television. Well, so have you had to pay to get the stain re re removed? Oh, no, she moved. It was actually my friend, Patty Lapone. Oh. Which, now you know why I didn't tell her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she wouldn't be too happy. <laughs> Do you have a favorite episode of Modern Family? I, I have a lot of, I do like that New Year's Eve episode that I wrote with Abraham Higginbotham. We had a really good time writing that. I have some favorite, I, I think in all of the episodes, there are some favorite moments that I have. I loved obviously writing for, for Mitch. I loved writing for all of them. I really did. Every one of those characters, even the kids, even Lily. As a, as a, when she was really young, she was so funny because she was like, you know, we kept thinking her parents had rubbed off on her so we could write her like a Thelma Ritter character because she was brought up by these two gay guys who were funny and, and she would mimic them. Yeah, she was a mini wisecracker. Yeah, she was a mini. She would literally say at six years old, if they were late, today, ladies, come on. One time they came out wearing the same outfit, unbeknownst to each other. And they turned to her and they said, OK, Lily, it's time for who wore it best. And she was just like, I can't. I, I, I can't. Now, the Here's other her. big breakout star of Modern Family for me is Sofia Vergara. I think we watched an incredible growth in her comedic talents throughout the run of that series. And I hope she picks up with it and runs with it. I know she's on America's Got Talent being herself, 
But wouldn't it be great to see her go back to doing another show? Oh, she's she's effortlessly funny. She's she's really funny. I mean, the fact that her accent just got thicker instead of <laughs> <laughs> the other way around. She always knew, always knew what was funny. And if she didn't, she would just come up to you and say, how do I say this? How do I, just tell me, just put it in my ear. How do I say this? But she's just the loveliest. And plus Modern Family was like the fifth most income generating thing she did in the day. <laughs> she ran businesses, her endorsements, her, you know, this was like a side hustle for her. And she still brought it. And that character was super fun, super fun to write for. Because you could give her, you could give her a lot of words that you knew she would mangle. And sometimes you would write them mangled and she would say them exactly as written. Perfect. She's a perfect character. Yeah, what a wonderful person. Her likability is off the charts. Now, when I went to IMDb, Jeff, I saw that you wrote two of Barbara Streisand's TV concert specials. We recently had Richard J. Alexander on our show, and he said that working with Barbara was by far the most exhilarating work he's ever done. What was your experience working with her? Okay. So Richard J., who I'd known for years, called me and said, Barbara Streisand is, is she hadn't done a, a live concert in 15 years or whatever. She was going back out on a tour and he said, you know, I, I would love to put, throw your name in the ring for maybe writing it. And I was like, I, I don't do that. I mean, I had done it for Patty, but she's like my best friend. So I, it wasn't a thing that I was known to do, like Bruce Valanche does that, or there are people that just do that. Yeah. But he said, well, just, just meet her. So me, you know, a gay kid who just idolized her from funny girl on before, I was like, well, of course I'm going to take that meeting. I'm never going to do it, but I'll take the meeting. And I, I think I first had to meet her manager, Marty. And then I had to go to her house, Malibu. I was so nervous. Sat down with her, Marty, Richard J, and maybe the musical director. And we just started talking. And there was a part of me that was absolutely professional and, and on it and saying, well, here's what I think. What if you did this? And I remember when you did this. And what if it went like kind of this? And another part of me was, I can't believe I'm sitting here talking about this. So there were a dueling personalities there. And then, because I, I know in a meeting when you're, when you're sort of scoring and, you know, it, it's always better if, if the meeting is going well, if you end it, if, if you stand up and go, well, listen, you know, this has been fantastic. While she's laughing, I'm saying, I, I've just loved meeting you. And I'm sure you're going to see a million other people, but this has been just great. And she literally went, no, no, it's you do it. You do it. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I didn't even know. I mean, I was on a TV show at the time, Rules of Engagement. I was probably writing a pilot. I didn't even know what that job paid or what, what it was worth. And my agent was like, I, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not, you know, my agent who's a big deal was like, that seems like you get someone else to do that. So my friend, Mark Sendroff, who you also know. Yes, he's a very dear friend. Yes, very dear friend of mine as well. And he does those deals. So he 
made a really good deal for me. And I would go over after work, I would drive from the studio that I was working at to Malibu at six o'clock when I got off work, we would have dinner and then we would talk. And as you brought up about how does it feel when you communicate something funny and you hear that response, a, a huge gift was anytime I made her laugh. Wow. Anytime, because she is a really good customer. When, when, when it's funny for her, she'll laugh till she cries. And I mean, that didn't happen all the time, but it happened enough that we formed, it was really, really, and then when she would do that on stage in an arena and it would get a laugh from literally 18,000 people, that was a whole different experience because that's what I did. I just wrote her her dialogue. Well, I saw those concerts. I've got to say that Richard J has an instinct about people. He just knew you'd be right for her. It's amazing. And I got to applaud you because that part of your personality deep inside that was going, oh my God, I'm with Barbara Streisand. I can't believe that. For a lot of people, the creative side of you would have been shut down because it, it, it it's so overwhelming to be with an icon like that. And you kept it together. You said, obviously, what she needed to hear and, and liked hearing. It's not just that you made her laugh. You gave her ideas. And having seen both those concerts, I can see why. You know, it's intelligent humor. It reflects well on the public image she wants to project. I'm just thrilled. I mean, I'm just, I can't wait to call Mark Sendroff and tell him I'm so happy he made that deal for you. Yes, beyond. And and I got to travel with her, you know, uh, when I could, because that those, those were, there was a US tour and there was a European tour. I went to several of the US cities just because I would write new stuff for that city. I didn't, I, I, I think I was on Modern Family when she did the European tour, so I couldn't do that, but I wrote it. Also, by then in my career, I had worked with enough stars, even though she was in a league of her own in, in terms of my life and my experience, that I, of course, was going to be a professional. There, there was the part of me that was, that was only... I'm a professional, she's a professional. We are colleagues in this situation. And I could let the other fanboy kid be a voice in my head without intruding on my professional, what I had to do professionally. Well, and I, I really didn't to... even think I was gonna get do the job. I really didn't. So there well, were no stakes. I think you underestimate yourself. And I also think that your dear friend, Patty Lapone, we have to thank her too, because she has a larger than life persona. She's got a bit of the diva image and you knew how to deal with her. So you were well equipped. Yeah, I've written every one of her shows. So yeah, I had, I had done it. But as I say, I've known her for over 40 years. She's my best friend. So I I have her voice. I had just had a secret relationship with Barbara Streisand. <laughs> she didn't know we had a relationship. Well, I've been having a secret relationship with Patty Lapone for 40 years as well. Oh, really? And one of these days, I'm going to try to convince her to come on the show because I just think she's fabulous. Now, you got an Emmy nomination for writing the Academy Awards show in 2010. That's the show that was hosted by Alec Baldwin and Steve Martin. But as far as I know, Jeff, you have not written any more award shows. You're obviously very good at it. Why haven't you done more of it? I think number one, the, for me, that's the kind of thing you do once. Really? Uh, yeah. There's a lot of pressure. It's fun, but it also kind of ruins the Oscars for you because you you really see it's just a cheesy TV show. It's, I mean, I have sort of great stories from it, but.
but it's not like it's a huge paycheck. It's not, you're, you're pretty much sequestered in a room for four days. You're writing before that, but the last four days of it, you're in the room with a few writers. And in, in my year, it was Steve and Alec. And you're coming up with their stuff, but you're also, you're having to write those. A repartee. Of, yeah. And as the Tony Awards this year proved you, because there were no writers writing it. Right. You can do those shows and not have that. Yeah. What yeah. was, what was fun about that experience of the Oscars was seeing just how that sausage was made. And, and like I said, there are people who go from literally the Oscars to the Emmys to the tone, the same people, right? And I think Bruce Valanche was, it oh, was yeah. the year that I wrote it. Yeah, he was uh, on our show. He talked about it and he described it very much as you do. Yeah, and the rehearsals, I remember, I remember the women, well, everybody, but the women especially have to walk the stage in the shoes that they will be wearing because the stage is always, the set is raked and there's stairs. And so every one of those presenters has to come in just in the shoes. You know, they're, they're a mess, but they're wearing those shoes. And they have a fake Oscar. And this is for, for timing as well. And they, and this is the biggest stars in Hollywood, including Barbara Streisand, Julia Roberts. You, you know, they they come in, they read, you know, the nominees are, and they have to say, at this rehearsal, the Oscar goes to, and then there are fake, in the audience, winners. This, this, yeah, this, I wonder if I'm allowed to be saying this anyway. The Oscar goes to Cameron Diaz and fake Cameron Diaz, who's a who's a seat filler, runs up, takes the fake Oscar from real Barbara Streisand, who's standing there, gives a fake acceptance speech as Cameron Diaz. I want to thank my agent. I want to thank Donna. This part was so important to me for, and then fake Cameron Diaz and real Barbara Streisand walk off the stage so that they can time that, they can time the show. But they don't know how long the real acceptance speech is gonna be. But they have to have an idea so they know what to cut. Okay, I want a job as one of those seat fillers. Anyway, watching that, you, you're just like, this is, insane it you know used to be the oscars and now it's just this <laughs> now you're co-creator and executive producer of uncoupled it's a wonderful romantic comedy series starring neil patrick harris who plays as you mentioned a gay man in his 40s he's navigating the world of being single after being dumped by his longtime partner how did you and darren star come up with the premise for the show did one of you get dumped we both knew we were looking for uh, a jumping off point for a gay leading man in a romantic comedy. And we both happened to know long-term couples, gay couples, long-term gay couples, where one of the partners secretly plotted to leave the relationship and only told the partner when they were literally out the door. Like, I'm leaving. I I already know where I'm going and I don't want to talk about it. And that seemed like, first of all, like, an, like, how do you get over that? But it seemed like a really good jumping off point for our character, we weren't gonna follow the other guy. It was just, what is that? See, how do you get back 
you're 48 years old, you think it's done. You think it's done. Yeah. And then that happens. And Darren had written a story many, many years ago about a woman in her 60s who, who gets dumped. And that seemed not quite as fresh to us. I mean, it wasn't because it was years ago. We wanted to tell, we wanted to tell this story this way, but we took that character that he had done years ago and put it alongside Neil's character. Marsha Gay Harden played that part. A woman in her 60s who's going through kind of the same thing and who has it worse. A woman but you in know, her I don't know if Mark can't. Sandroff told you this, but before I retired last year, I was a family and criminal court judge for 26 yes, years. That. And I saw many couples, they were all straight, the ones I saw. But I have saw that many times where someone had a bomb dropped into their life. So if you're ever looking for uh, story ideas, I can tell you some real ones because it does happen for both gays and straights. And, you know, I loved season one. It was on Netflix. And even though the show got rave reviews, Netflix refused to renew it for a second season. Why? A, a few things. Netflix is a, a global entity. And our year there, like I said, they were fantastic creative partners. They never, they, they loved it. They never, we got one note on a cut not one note in scripts, nothing. Just loved everything about it. With good reason. It was great. Thank you. Because, because of the pretty gay show, it did not perform in, in parts of the world where you just can't be gay. So all of China, all of Asia, all of the Arab worlds where Netflix has a big presence, it it underperformed in their parlance. But because the the production was financed by by Viacom, Paramount, and Showtime, they wanted it. They always wanted it. They wanted it the first season for Paramount uh, for Showtime. But we wanted to be on Netflix. So when Showtime went, please come back, Netflix finally released it. And now we get to do season two on Showtime. So when do we get to see season two? Well, we were in the middle of writing it when the strike happened. Oh. So we will go back as soon as the strike is over. And season two already is, you know, it's it's pretty great. It's pretty great. He's he's got a big decision to make at the end of season one, and I think people that follow the show and like it will will appreciate what we're doing. Well, you know, I'm very intrigued by your comments that the marketability of the show on Netflix in certain countries wasn't high because of the gay context. Because what I really loved about Uncoupled. I'm just speaking for myself here. The Neil Patrick Harris character to me is universal. He's experiencing exactly the same feelings and disappointments and anxieties that anyone going through a breakup and trying to reinvent themselves as a single person would go through whether they are gay and straight. There's no, in my opinion, there's no gay agenda. Uh, that's really very refreshing. And so, and I, t and I tell you this as someone who saw real couples who had gone through this, who were not gay, but the stories that you came up with were very universal, very applicable. So I think it's rather sad that in those countries where homosexuality is frowned on, that a show like Uncoupled wouldn't have been seen as very applicable, very current and relevant in the same way that Modern Family was for Cam and Mitch, who were like any couple. It's interesting. Certainly Netflix didn't anticipate that because they were very, very eager to, to buy it and make it. We, the gay press in America, especially, you know, their criticism about Ham and Mitch initially, and I have to say it was 
disappointing. You know, why aren't we seeing them be more physically sort of affectionate with each other? Why? First of all, it was a family sitcom. Second of all, the other two couples weren't, Sophia and Ed weren't making out all the time because of the sort of freedom that we had on Netflix, we were, and because he was for the first time, that character exploring dating, we were able to go much further just in terms of comedy and in terms of a, a not graphic, but a depiction. Explicit. There's yeah. an explicitness to it. The scene with uh, Gilles Marini, who came on our show right after filming it, you know, I think it's it was more realistic for sure. And I think there were audiences that weren't, maybe it was that they weren't prepared for to see Neil that way, or they weren't prepared to see, because you... You don't see a lot of comedies where it, the comedy is happening with two men in bed. And coming from Mitch and Cam, you know, Neil is sexy and the show, we and we wanted the show to be sexy. And, and it still will be. But anyway, that's why it's on Showtime. Was it important to you and Darren Starr that the person playing the lead be an out gay character? 100%. And that pool is pretty shallow. Yet we would not have done the show with a straight lead. You know, in terms of casting the rest of it, we really were like the best actor is going to get the part. But the lead as two gay creators we knew the stories we wanted to tell we did not want the obstacle of the audience having to imagine a straight actor because it needed also to be star so if if you were gonna cast ty burrell in that part you were gonna have to already make one more leap of imagination and we we didn't want the audience to have to do that we wanted to tell an authentic story and because it was 2022 or whatever we could do that but as i say if neil turns it down there were certainly other actors on the list but he was always the first choice i'm so glad about that you know jeffrey what I found fascinating about Uncoupled is that for those of us who've been in relationships a long time, I was amazed to see how much the dating world has changed since we were single. There are all these apps now and people can use, if they want to hook up with somebody, they, 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 they use technology. I got quite an education from your show. Yeah, we did too. And I think that, I mean, I've been at, at that time, I made his relationship the length of my relationship, which three years ago when we did it was 17 years. So I could picture what that would be like. That's a long time for that character to have been out of the dating world. And in that 17 years, I mean, my God, the technology has just galloped past him. I wouldn't know where to begin. And especially, well, I'm older. But, you know, he's almost 50. He hasn't thought about his viability in the dating world. It was, it was an interesting world to explore. And it's, it continues to be interesting for us. Should we draw any significance from the fact that shows with gay lead characters like Queer as Folk and Uncoupled always seem to be on cable networks and streaming platforms rather than on the traditional major networks like ABC, NBC, CBS. Is that significant? Well, I think there's no uncoupled, there's no Queer's Folk without Will and Grace. And Will and Grace was a network TV show. But again, 
there's only so much you can show realistically on broadcast television. And that was about, that was America's first sort of welcoming gay characters into their homes in a, in a, in a really broad way, even though it was pretty much couched as a love story between Will and his best girlfriend, it still made it palatable for modern family to come in. No, I don't think, you know, I think now there's shows about every kind of sexuality, every kind of, they just, in America, I think people are very, very open to any kind of good entertainment. I hope so. Well, if I'm not mistaken, you produced another series 20 years ago called Charlie Lawrence with a gay lead character played by Nathan Lane. And that show was really funny. It was canceled after only seven episodes, which shocked me. Do you think you were just too ahead of your time back then? I do think that the network CBS got nervous behind focus groups. And, you know, Nathan had just had a huge success in the producers on Broadway. And there was a sweepstakes among writers to get him as the lead in a TV show. He had a deal at CBS and there were many writers that came and pitched him an idea. And not all of them were gay characters. And he picked the one that I came up with, which was lovely. And he was a lovely partner. He's a dear friend today, still. He was a, you know, we made up, I made up that part for him on, on Modern Family, Pepper, three Emmy nominations. I think once it was done, yeah, it was a good show. I'm really proud of it. I think they got cold feet. Yeah, you were ahead of your time. So of course I have to ask you, you're best friends with Patty Lapone since you were in your 20s. When are you gonna write a series for Patty Lapone in the lead role? Well, we have always been, whenever I've had the opportunity to do that, she's been booked. Whenever she's been free, I've been on a TV show already. I've tried to get her. She was on Frasier. I've done a few pilots that I've worked on a few pilots that she's been in. Not that I've created, but we work together all the time. I'm writing a show for her for Carnegie Hall next April. I write all of her shows. I, I participated a great deal in her book, her memoir. Yeah. I wrote, we work together a lot. Well, I hope there's going to be that long running series that I envision with you creating a role for her. You know, when I look at your career, the trajectory of it, it seems clear that not only do you have a strong sense of what projects are right for you at the time, but you're very in tune with your destiny and how to manifest those projects. Does that make any sense to you? Well, it it is exactly the story of Uncoupled. After Modern Family ended, after 11 years, two weeks before the lockdown. So we were actually able to finish, do our finale, have the parties, have the hugs goodbye. You know, I, I, I knew those children since they're like 10 years old. I, they grew up, we grew up together. I knew that I was never gonna do another network I didn't want to do 24 episodes of anything ever again. And I thought and said, my the next thing I want to do is eight episodes of something on Netflix with a partner. I don't want to do it by myself. And I, I want to do a, a passion project, but only eight episodes. And I want to do it on Netflix. And my agent, Jay Suris, who's also Darren's agent. We were acquaintances, but had never worked together. 
fans of each other's work, put us together, said, you two write something together. He was just in the coming off younger. He also had Emily in Paris. He was looking for another project. We came up with this in six months into the pandemic. We wrote it going back and forth. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Figured it out. Finally had a script. Jay slipped the script to Netflix without telling us. And they bought it as a series overnight. It was a fairy tale, but it was like, I, that's the thing I knew I wanted to do after Modern Family. And I yeah, got to- you, you manifest your destiny in a very palpable, concrete way. And I've heard you say before in interviews that relationships are everything in this business. What did you mean by that? You know, you you find your your tribe, the people that you want to work with. A lot of because, especially comedy writing, is done communally. You're in a room with other writers, and your your whole job is to make those people laugh. You, so you continually, hopefully you work with the people that you reliably know are really good at their jobs and that you want to show up and be with every day. So without those relationships, it's like all the uncoupled, our uncoupled staff, you know, Darren and I handpicked from relationships that we had, you know, Abraham, Don Ruse. This year I have Suzanne Martin, and, and Tracy Powell, they're all people that I, I want to work with time and again, because they're, you, there's no weak link. And often in a writer's room, there are people that do the heavy lifting. And there are other people that, like I said, on Frasier, you were gone. Modern Family, the same thing. If you didn't, Modern Family was lucky in that the first five years, especially, we were the same staff and you, you, you just, there wasn't any bad place to look in that room. Everybody was so gifted. So you want to keep working with the same people. So you make those relationships and then you, if I get a show, I'm hiring you. If you get a show, you're hiring me. And that's, you know, I did like four or five shows with Chris and Steve shows with Suzanne, show, I, I, you just, that's what you do. And you feel lucky. Yeah, you have a magnet in you to attract people that are like-minded. It's it's just been an enormous honor and a pleasure having you on our show, Jeff. Thank Pardon. you for all the wonderful entertainment you've brought us over the years. Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. So, so nice. Thank you. I've watched your, I watched the Susan Silver interview. So fantastic. Anyway, thank you for having me and, and best of luck. And best of luck to you too. I can't wait for season two of Uncoupled. Thanks so much. Our guest has been the brilliant writer and producer, Jeffrey Richmond. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Deborah Batsafin, my PR director, Laurie Towers, and my entire team at the XPTV One Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.